from the sand itself, sometimes you might have inflow in this, an individual sand, but it's still, it might not be in the mean inflow layer um, because that could be different. Um, but uh, probably, I would say that most of the maximum wind speed suns are, are probably within the mean inflow layer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, the, those are, uh, those are, those are teams to relate to. Uh, when the maximum velocity appeared, uh, there is a uh, maximum wind speed very near, near the vertical, uh, maximum vertical velocity, uh, the place of maximum vertical velocity, you said. The vertical profile indicates... Oh, uh, yeah, the for some of the suns, yeah, not all of them, but some of them, there's uh -huh. a, there's a, the maximum wind speed is near the maximum vertical velocity. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of variability among the sons, yeah. Um, and for example, like, and, and there's an overlap in the data set. So some, um, a significant portion of the, of the peak of these sons with 90 meter per second winds also have 10 meter per second updraft, um, but not all of them. Um, and, and these sons with extreme updrafts, the ones that are maximized about two or three kilometers they're not going to have 90 meter per second oh, winds there because, oh, oh, oh. again, like look, the scale of, this, of these oh. two figures are different. This is the lowest oh, 1,500 meters. This is five kilometers. Oh, so you, you, yeah, the, the heights of the updrafts are, are higher oh. on average. Um, so as we go to finer and finer uh, resolution, um, we resolve more and more structures. But there's also difficulties in doing traditional mesoscale modeling because you start to explicitly resolve some turbulence while you're also parameterizing the turbulence. Um, because the PBL schemes are designed for an assumption that all turbulence needs to be parameterized. Um, so when you're so resolving turbulence while parameterizing it, you can, um, it could be problematic. Um, this is often called the turbulent gray zone. Um, and just like a figure um, for a study that examined this, uh, this is from Green and Zhang, um, uh, looking at uh, simulations of uh, Hurricane Katrina, and this is just plots of 10 meter wind speed for three one kilometer and 333 meters. And um, in 333 meters, you're starting to resolve turbulent structures, but you're also, in this case, they were also parameterizing the turbulence. And so there's a lot of uncertainty there about whether you might be um, making the flow, um, it's having too much mixing, for example. Um, and another example of a simulation in the gray zone uh, would be, uh, this is a, a, a simulation um, uh, from uh, uh, Nolan et al. Uh, in 2007. This is a, a simulation of um, Hurricane Isabel. Um, and I made this movie from the simulation a while ago. Um, this is a grid spacing of 444 meters, and this is showing vertical velocity. Um, and you can see that we're resolving all these fine scale features in the eye wall, these small scale extreme updrafts of greater than 10 meters per second. Um, and then inside the eye, there's weaker vertical velocity, but there's quite a lot of bit of variability as well. So the eye wall is very turbulent in the hurricane. Uh, this is uh, a plot from Rogers et al. from observations, a composite of major hurricanes, computing a measure of, of turbulent kinetic energy um, as a function of normalized radius. So one is the RMW, and then versus physical height from zero to 14 kilometers. And so outside of the RMW, um, the boundary layer is very turbulent. Um, but above the boundary layer, there's not much turbulence. But in the eye wall, so where our star, where the normalized arm radius equals one, um, the eye wall is turbulent at all heights. Um, but it's especially turbulent in the lowest two kilometers. Excuse me, how, how did he define prime? Uh, I have to look back at the paper. I think it's a, uh, it has to do with, um, I think it's different than a definition that's often used. I think they, they it's based on radar data, um, and I think they did like the variation uh, within a grid cell, um, how much each, how much uh, there was fluctuations within a single analysis grid, um, and then averaged it spatially. 
Um, but I'd have to check the paper to be, to be sure about what they did exactly. Like the units here aren't necessarily comparable um, to what you might find from TK unit simulation, for example. But qualitatively, what it shows is that you get large turbulence in the eye wall and especially in the boundary layer. Um, and, and just to, to briefly show, like you can, um, the hurricane boundary layer, you get uh, turbulent structures such as uh, organized rolls that happen. Um, this is a study from a solo et al. from radar data. This is the perturbation radial velocity at 300 meters height. So you get these uh, roll vortices with alternating um, uh, inflow and outflow, and there's a vertical circulation associated with them. Um, and several observational and, and numerical studies have shown that roll vortices are very common in the hurricane boundary layer, um, at least outside of the Iowa region. And these scales um, are very, but are generally sub-kilometer, um, so you're not able to resolve them uh, with, a, with a mesoscale simulation. Um, and this is just another example um, of rolls um, from this paper by Faceba and Worman, um, showing the, the, the vertical uh, and radial circulation through a roll in Hurricane Francis. Um, and rolls tend to transport high momentum air upwards and low momentum air downwards. Um, and so they affect the, the tangential wind speed. Um, and again, these features are generally unresolved in mesoscale models. And what I've been interested in are these coherent eye wall vortices. So the, th the features that we think are responsible for creating these extreme wind gusts and the extreme updrafts. So this is a Haberson et al. study of Hurricane Isabel. Um, this is the radar reflectivity, a horizontal cross-section. Um, and you can see lots of small-scale features right on the edge of the eye wall. You get these uh, kind of fingers of reflectivity arcing into the eye. Um, and you can see this in simulations of, of very high-resolution simulations mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the plane flew into, they believe, this feature here, this little isolated uh, reflectivity region kind of on the edge of the eye. Um, and then on the bottom, this is the vertical radial cross section. So the plane uh, was flying um, just above this feature and then entered the eye wall. And they did an analysis of the wind speed and the vertical vorticity. Um, and they, they analyzed the uh, from the radar analysis, um, a very strong uh, vorticity feature here um, associated with a very strong gradient in the horizontal wind speed. So this is similar to what we think we're seeing with the drop signs. So this along with the Marks et al. study and, and other, some other recent studies suggest that we have small scale three dimensional vortices that can form along the inner edge of the eye wall. And I think with the drops on, some of the time we're sampling these types of vortices, but it's really hard from the drops on to, to be sure what we're sampling because mm -hmm. we're only getting just a single um, a trajectory. Um, so uh, the limitations of cloud permitting circulation simulations, so mesoscale simulations, like we typically perform at one to four kilometer grid spacing, are that important structures are unresolved. So these eyewall vortices are unresolved at these scales. And so we need to have a finer resolution, um, grid spacing at least four to six times smaller than the scale of the feature. And the scale of these features, these vortices, we believe, is on the order of a kilometer or maybe 500 meters. And so to really resolve this, we need a grid spacing of less than 100 meters. And then we... Um, the large eddies are largely re mostly resolved, and we don't need to parameterize the boundary layer. And one of the um, earlier studies doing large eddy simulation of the hurricane is uh, Rotuno et al. Um, and they did a wharf LES simulation. Um, and this shows wind speed at 10 meters height um, from <coughs> four different grid spacings going from 1.67 uh, to 556, to 185 meters, to 62 meters. Um, and they found uh, that in this simulation, the turbulence structures really only develop when the grid spacing got below 100 meters. And at 62 meter grid spacing, there's all these little fine scale features. Um, that's the instantaneous structure of the wind speed. Um, but when they looked at the one minute mean, it's much weaker. So the, the much one minute average winds are much less than the instantaneous winds. So I've done work using um, the CM1 model um, 
which is similar to WARF in that it's a non-hydrostatic cloud resolving model. Um, unlike WARF, which uses uh, multiple nested grids to have fine resolution, CM1 has a single domain with grid stretching, and you can configure this for a large eddy simulation. And this shows the layout of a horizontal grid and showing how we have a region of very fine grid spacing near the center, um, and then stretching away from the center. Um, the simulation that I'm going to show you, there's an 80 by 80 by 3 kilometer deep box with this constant, very high resolution, um, and no PPL scheme here. And then the rest of the domain, there's stretching of the grid spacing and the uh, turbulence is all parameterized. And this is a schematic uh, that George Bryan made to illustrate um, the, the framework of this technique. Uh, so the entire tropical cyclone is very large thousands of kilometers, so we need to have a very big domain, but it's hard to have uh, fine grid spacing over that entire domain, so we have this LES subdomain, which again is part of, it's all one single domain, but with the grid stretching, and so this is the 80 by 80 kilometer box, and that contains the eye wall and eye region, and in this region, most of the turbulence is going to be explicitly resolved because we have high enough resolution. And then outside of this box, um, all turbulence is parameterized, uh, a coarser resolution um, and a PBL scheme. <coughs> so um, this shows um, how the wind speed looks when you do uh, simulations of increasing resolution um, from um, 125 meters at the top, 62 and a half meters in the middle, and 31.25 meter horizontal grid spacing at the bottom here. And this is uh, a movie that George Bryan made. Um, and you can see uh, we, we start to resolve a lot of turbulence at 125 meters, but you get much finer structures for the finer resolution. And you also get uh, stronger wind speeds. Um, and you can see that we start to get um, wind speeds of um, well over 100 meters per second and as high as 120 meters per second here for this 30 meter simulation. And you get all sorts of fine scale structures along the IIOL interface. Um, this is a, a, a larger scale version view of, of the whole inner core of the 30 meter simulation, um, just showing we have the eye and we have the eye wall with these small scale wind features translating around rapidly, occasionally stronger than 120 meters per second. Um, this is the, the peak instantaneous wind speed versus time. Um, so we're running a four hour simulation here starting from an intense, uh, already intense hurricane um, from an axisymmetric initial condition. And uh, the blue line shows the 10 meter wind speed and the, the black line shows the peak wind speed at any height. Um, and so starting from the axisymmetric condition where there's no turbulence, no asymmetries, you rapidly develop local intense wind gusts that are much stronger than the mean. And it only takes about 10 to 20 minutes to reach uh, equilibrium. Um, and it's kind of steady after that time. And you'll notice that the peak wind speeds are very strong. Um, at the surface, they're 110 to 120 meters per second. And above the surface, you have wind gusts of 120 to 140 meters per second at all times. Um, and that might seem unrealistic. Um, these instantaneous wind gusts are extremely strong. But if we look at the, the mean wind, which, um, this blue line here is the one minute average wind, the peak of that one minute average as a function of time. It's much weaker, about 80 meters per second, which corresponds to a category five storm. Um, so the mean winds we know are realistic, and then it's just a question of whether, are these gusts realistic or not? So this is uh, another view. This is the wind speed at 10 meters height, horizontal cross section. On the left is the instantaneous wind speed, and on the right is the one minute average wind speed. Um, we have numerous instantaneous wind gusts exceeding 100 meters per second. That's these red blobs here. Um, but they're small in scale, and they move very fast around the eye wall. So at any given point, um, you would only experience it for up just a few seconds. So the average wind speed of a one minute wind speed um, that we use in the US that's only 70 to 80 meters per second throughout the eye wall, it's much weaker. Um, and if you use the 10 minute mean, um, it would be slightly weaker, but fairly similar to, to this plot on the right. 
So, excuse me. Yes. So, by averaging, so time averaging, the result is close to the uh, simulation with PBL. So, it, this it, simulation is using the area smaller. Yeah. But uh, so, by uh, taking the timing, time averaging for this result, that result is close to the PVL scheme or not? The, um, it, it, uh, the one minute mean here is close to what you would get for a similar environment if you ran uh, a, a mesoscale simulation of one to two kilometers, yeah. yes. Um, we didn't. I didn't run, and George didn't run a, yeah. a thirty-meter simulation with a PBL yes. scheme because that would probably might do something unrealistic. But yes, the, the, for the same environment here, this is a si similar mean wind speed that you would get if you did a mesoscale simulation. Another thing we can think about is uh, like you, you usually use a drug coefficient and yeah. you know, VRC interaction coefficient, mm -hmm. but that. Is you know already that is a parameterization yeah. uh, of small scale features less than ten minutes and yeah. so our I think our numerical model result themselves already you know includes <laughs> some parameterized time scale yeah. so I think it's it's very uh, difficult uh, to interpret this result as it is maybe the best uh, answer can be done you know is our zero when zero, you know, wind speed at the surface, or just if possible, you know, just a surface current, waves, speed yes, current. Exactly. But uh, I think it must, should not be, you know, yeah. possible in a next no. test, five, 10 years, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But I think, yeah, yeah I agree, yeah. this kind of small scale features mm -hmm. is, is uh, mm -hmm. really exist. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, I think that we should uh, consider, you know, mm. the, uh, yeah, exactly. you know so what we possible. see and, you know. Yeah. Interpretation. Yeah, I mean, I agree that there's uncertainty very near the surface mm -hmm. uh, where the vertical. So the I'll say like in the in the lowest 50 meters, um, there's there's still a contribution from the LES subgrid scheme mm -hmm. that's significant. Mm -hmm. But above that height, um, uh, the, the turbulence is almost all explicitly resolved. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like there's there's we don't know the the drag coefficient uh, perfectly and um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there's ultimately some parameterization <coughs> that you have to do no matter what. Um, so uh, that 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 adds uncertainty. But to the extent that we can compare this to observations, um, I think they're they're consistent with each other. So um, also similar uh, aspect, uh, how many vertical levels or the oh so uh, the lowest height uh, model height is. Uh, the, Required for simulate such kind of the fine structures. So, so in, in this simulation, um, the vertical grid spacing yes, is, yes. is half of the horizontal. So it's 15 huh. meter vertical grid yeah. spacing um, in the lowest three kilometers, yeah. and then it stretches above three kilometers. Okay. Um, yes. So um, something that we can do to try to compare uh, the simulation to observations, we, the observations we have are, are dropsons. Um, and uh, one of my points is that the dropsons we observe, they're, they're sparse, and we don't know the structures that they're sampling. But in the simulation, we know the three-dimensional structure of the winds at all time and other variables. And we can drop simulated dropsons to, to, to try to understand more about what we're sampling with the observed dropsons. So in the simulation, I released uh, dropsons um, every 250 meters uh, horizontally. This black dots here show the layout of the dropson locations, but only every one kilometer. So the actual density of the simulated dropsons I'm releasing is 16 times what's shown here. And so that's released over the entire 80 by 80 kilometer box of the um, LES subdomain. So that results in 103,000 virtual dropsons. And um, an example of what a trajectory might look like for one of these, this is uh, a three-dimensional trajectory of part of, of, of the path of a, a simulated drops on for a coarser simulation at 125 meter grid spacing. And this shows these cross sections are the horizontal wind speed at 10 meters height and 560 meters height. And the color bars on the right here, so these red blobs are 90 meter per second or greater. Um, 
So near the surface, we have some 90 meter per second wind gusts um, here, and then we have even stronger winds at 500 meters. And this simulated drop sun, um, it falls, and it's colored by the horizontal wind speed that it samples. So you can see the very strong um, gradients in the, in, the, in the wind speed um, increasing from 75 to 90 meters per second over a very short distance. Um, in this case, the sun is, is, is being evicted into um, this very strong uh, band of, of wind speed here. Um, and some of you saw this plot the other day um, <laughs> uh, about <laughs> trying to uh, figure out what drop suns are real and which ones are fake. So eight of these are vertical profiles of vertical velocity um, from the simulation, from the 31 meter vertical resolution simulation, or sorry, 31 meter horizontal resolution. Um, and one of these is a real drop sun. Um, and uh, anyone wants to guess who wasn't here for the presentation I gave the other day where I answered the question. I guess yeah. right now. <laughs> well, now you Maybe the middle of the Oh. Yes, you're right. It is the middle of the bottom. Oh. Oh. What? How, how did it feel? I remember the profile. Yeah, so I saw it. Yeah, so, it was, it. Ah. so you have a good memory. Is that the profile I showed you earlier? Ah. I should have picked a different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, it's fun. Like some pe a couple people were able to remember the profile from before, but usually most people don't remember it. So <laughs> you have a good memory for these things. <laughs> so uh, the other day, no one was able to guess it, and uh, I, I think um, largely it's very difficult to tell these profiles apart. Um, I chose them because they all have about the same updraft at about the same height, but otherwise they're just kind of randomly chosen. Um, and so you get the similar scales of fluctuations in, in, the, in, in the real sun as you do in the, the simulated drop suns. And I think that's pretty good evidence that we're resolving enough turbulence in, in these 30 meter simulations to, to realistically um, model the hurricane boundary layer and to compare to observations. And you can also look at the wind speed versus height for those same nine sons. Again, the, the, this middle bottom one is the actual Isabel son. And you get similar structures um, in all of these sons. Um, and I haven't checked, but probably the fact that you have a deep layer of nearly constant wind for most of this profile means that the simulated sons were all dropped kind of um, in the middle of the eye wall towards where the flight level winds would be maximized. So they're, they're, they're going outside of where the boundary layer winds are maximized, which is similar to the observed Isabel sound. So in the simulation, um, we can look at where the, these ex most extreme wind gusts are found. Um, so this is uh, the azimuthal mean tangential wind um, radius and height. and the white dots here are the location of the maximum wind for wind gusts stronger than 110 meters per second. And the black dots are the locations where they were released in the simulation. And so we can see that the strongest wind gusts here, they're all found near where the mean winds are strongest. Um, and they're found throughout like the lowest kilometer or so. And that in order to sample these strongest wind gusts, you need to drop the drop signs inside of the flight level RMW. Um, and this is known observationally, um, and this is why um, NOAA and the Air Force will intentionally release signs not where they find the maximum winds at flight level, but a few kilometers inwards to try to sample the peak winds below. So you can, in the simulation, you can try to look at how frequently you might expect to sample the most extreme winds. Um, and so this shows the fraction of sun sampling extreme winds um, as a function of radial distance, so the radius where you drop them in the simulation. And the orange lines show the radius of maximum wind at effectively the flight level in the simulation where we're dropping the sons um, here. Um, and then this is the um, radius of maximum wind at the surface. So you can see. The, the region where you can sample the strongest winds um, is, is four to eight kilometers inwards of the flight level RMW. 
and these different colored lines correspond to the frequency that you sample winds in excess of 90, 95, 100, 105, and 110 meters per second. And so for the 90 meter per second winds, which we somewhat frequently observe in the observation in the, the drop zones, um, in this simulation you very frequently sample um, such winds uh, when you drop in this region. But as you increase the threshold, you rapidly decrease the probability that you're going to sample them. So for a greater than 110 meters per second, you only have this two kilometer wide zone where you have any chance of sampling it. And even so, it's just two or three percent. So even though I showed that the, the, you have wind gusts somewhere in the tropical cyclone in the simulation of 120, 130 meters per second at all times, it's nearly impossible to sample it uh, with drop sons. We can, um, we can compare the simulation to the observation um, by looking at uh, the, the, the distribution of the maximum wind speed um, between the simulated signs on the left and the observed signs on the right. Um, and um, the magnitude of the strongest sampled wind gust is comparable. It's about 110 to 115 meters per second in both of them. Um, there's a difference in the distribution. The simulated signs on the left sample the most extreme values uh, more frequently than, than we've observed. Uh, you can see they're more concentrated at the left tail of the distribution than the observations. Um, and, and there could be a number of reasons for this. There might be biases in the simulation, um, but I think the most likely reason is because the simulated tropical cyclone here is a, just a little bit stronger than the average tropical cyclone from the data set that we have. The drop zones are all from very intense storms, but the, the intensity um, still um, is different. There, there are some storms that are category four, some are weak category five, some are strong category five. And so the simulated storm here is a strong category five. Um, so you would expect to get somewhat more intense gusts, and so the frequency distribution will get shifted over to the right. Um, so it's difficult to just compare this single simulation to observations that come from many different storms at different intensities. Um, so I think overall, qualitatively, this actually compares pretty well. We're getting the right order of magnitude um, for the strongest wind gusts that we sample in tropical cyclones, which in the simulation is, a, is weaker than the strongest winds we know are there. And so we can speculate that it's re that that the wind real strong gusts and tropical observed tropical cyclones might also be much stronger than we sample. So, um, this is a plot um, of uh, six thousand drop signs, the blue dots. Um, these are all the NOAA drop signs um, from flights into tropical cyclones, and. Uh, this is showing the maximum wind speed measured by the drop sign in meters per second against the best track intensity, which is in knots. So I apologize for the confusing mix of units, um, but because we tend to, we do best track intensity in the Atlantic in knots, um, that, that's um, the data set um, um, to compare to. So what I'm showing here is, is, is I'm trying to look at what is the strongest wind speed or wind gust that you would measure with a sond for a storm of a given mean intensity. Um, and the blue dots are, are all the sonds, and not all of these are on the eye wall. Some are in the eye. Some are well away from the center of the storm. So we don't expect them to sample the strongest wind speeds, and that's why we have such a huge variability. So what we want to know is um, what are the strongest wind gusts that you might expect to sample in the eye wall for a given mean intensity. And so to get that, I bin the drop sons every five knots. Um, and so that's what this black line shows. So, um, and this is as we might expect, as the mean intensity increases, you get stronger and stronger peak gusts from the drop sons. And um, the 90 meter per second gusts, you really only sample for storms stronger than about 135 knots or, or 100 or about 65 meters per second. Um, and there's less and less data as you get to the really strong storms. Um, but So this is the 110 meter per second from, from Super Typhoon Maggie here for this 160 knot storm. 
Um, and one final check on the comparison between the simulation and the observations, we can randomly sample the simulated drop signs and try to 